Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today we're going to talk about infidelity versus moving towards deeper intimacy in a relationship. What triggered this is not only do I have a lot of clients who come to me to work on infidelity, but the statistic is that 80% of marriages experience infidelity at one time or another. 80%, that's eight out of 10. And so what that means is that eight out of 10 marriages are either going to experience infidelity or have experienced infidelity. And the question is why? Why is it that it's so prevalent? The starting point for this conversation has to do with needs and meeting needs. And the fact of the matter is that people have needs that are mental or emotional, let's say, spiritual and physical. So let's talk about those needs for just a quick second. Mental and, emo mental and emotional needs, very hard to define, but everyone has a need to feel loved and feel appreciated and feel listened to and feel heard. Everyone has a need to be respected. Everyone has a need to have trust, to feel that someone is listening to them in a way that's caring. Is everyone capable of delivering those needs? Great question. Are you receiving all of those needs in your marriage? Great question. Spiritual needs. What are spiritual needs? Spirituality, we're going to define here as that sense of connection. Because let's, I mean, the most basic level, it's that sense of connection to other people, connection to nature, connection one with the universe. Um, and if you have a higher power in your life, it might be a direct connection to God, whatever you call God. It's that sense that you are a part of. And I guess what I'm going to ask you is, how alone do you feel at times? How often do you feel connected? And how much do you count on your marriage to deliver that sense of connection? And how disappointed or how often do you take that sense of not being connected and critique your marriage with it? All right, let's talk about the most important part, right? Physical needs. We all have physical needs. Uh, very often marriages, we hope, have a high level of physical intimacy. We know that when two people meet, they fall in love and they're like usually having all kinds of physical intimacy in the beginning when they're in love. They're, it's, it's wonderful. They're attentive to each other's needs. They get married and have children and something changes. And so we know that uh, there's something about the getting married and the having children that changes that dynamic. And what we know for sure about falling in love is that it is measured as having a two to three year shelf life. So studies on falling in love shows that people fall in love for two to three years, that's it. And something happens after two to three years, they fall out of love. Maybe it's the getting married, maybe it's the having kids, we don't know, but, with that intense attending to one another's needs that comes with falling in love, with that ending also comes a drop in physical intimacy and physical needs being met. And so what I'm gonna ask you is, how disappointed are you that that's not going on anymore? If you've had children and one of you for one reason or another is less interested in being intimate than they were, how disappointed are you that you're not having that physical intimacy. How much are you judging the health and well being of your marriage by that? All right, so infidelity. Happy marriages can have infidelity. Did you know that? You don't just have to be unhappy. And it's because everything might be going well in the marriage. You might be um, showing up as excellent parents. You might be going to parties together and showing up as good partners. You might even be having some conversation. but. The truth is that if one of these air need areas is not being fulfilled, it opens up the possibility of infidelity. And what are we calling infidelity here? Is infidelity the act of having someone in your body or inserting yourself in someone else's body? Or is infidelity 
when you are emotionally intimate with someone in a way that you should reserve for your marriage only? Or is it, uh, if you have sex with a hooker, is that infidelity? If you get a lap dance, is that infidelity? If you go out to a party or go out to a bar and meet a guy and flirt with him and maybe you even make out, is that infidelity? If you get obsessed with your work to the point where you're less attentive to your partner's needs in all three areas, and because you're getting all your fulfillment from your work, is that infidelity? And the answer for some people to those questions is yes, and for other people is no, you get to define what infidelity is. And I would argue that any time that we are getting our needs filled only and exclusively in another area without the explicit permission or understanding of our partner, that infidelity in some way, shape or form is present. That would be my argument. Um, inf because the marital agreement, the marital partnership is that you're gonna be there for each other. You're gonna help one another get fu feel fulfilled to help one another have growth. The marital agreement and understanding whether articulated or just assumed is that the person that you saw your partner as being, that amazing person that you were madly in love with, that you would do anything for back then before you found out they had warts and farted and peed and all that other stuff, that your job is to help them become that person and vice versa. And so the second that we start going to other people to become that person without the explicit permission of our partner, we're breaking an agreement or an understanding, whether articulated or just assumed. And so I want you to consider carefully, how much conversation are you having with your partner about your, how your needs, about your needs and how they're being met? Now, more important is that when people do commit infidelity, it's because they feel that something is missing in their lives. They're often not sure what it is. Um, I have a couple of clients, one right now uh, with infidelity that had gone on and it happened during the pandemic and they're suffering from uh, another diagnosis and the infidelity was a way, it was exciting to them. They felt like they were stuck and it was exciting. I have a client who I'm no longer working with uh, they've resolved their infidelity issue, who felt that, again, he uh, had a diagnosis and he was very stuck in his life and his, he, felt, he had his wife's absolute trust. And the, the idea of having an affair was exciting and engaged him in a way that wasn't happening in another, other, any other area in his life. It was, now, does that mean that they wanted to leave their wives? No. They both love their wives and they both worked it through. But what it does say is that in one of these three areas, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, they felt stuck, maybe all three. And that the act of intimacy was less about cheating on their wives and more about fulfilling the, an unfulfilled need. I'm gonna say that again. Infidelity is often less about the other, your wife Sometimes it's not even about the person that you're having the relationship with, whatever kind of relationship it is. These gentlemen were having physical intimacy with these women. It's about feeling stuck. It's about feeling that in one or all area or two or all areas of your life, you're not moving forward and you've got to do something to shake it up. And obviously your wife or your husband can't help you because they're part of the problem, right? I mean, they committed to be there for you and to help you and to support you, and they don't even know that you're stuck. Now, that's not completely their fault, is it? I mean, in those situations, those examples that I gave you, they, neither of these gentlemen communicated to their wife that they were stuck. In fact, there wasn't even a conscious conversation happening about stuckness. It was an unconscious dialogue they were having with themselves. And in both of those cases, what had happened was that the couples, both of those couples were leading what I like to call parallel lives, where they were both getting their own needs fulfilled in work and they were sort of making sure that they showed up for their children and all the good things, uh, making sure that everything was functional, but they weren't feeding into their relationship. They had in some way sublimated or taken for granted 
that marital commitment to be there and help one another be the best person they could possibly be, to help one another evolve and grow into the person that they saw one another as when they were in love. Somehow they had lost sight of that and it had become very unconscious. My dog is panting away back here. This must be super exciting. So what we can infer from this is that the reason why 80% of the world, the married world commits infidelity is the unfulfilled needs. And it's not necessarily about your wife or your husband. It's about unfulfilled needs. And somewhere in there, there's this lack of communication. There's some almost like the agreement to be there for one another has been dismissed, forgotten, sublimated, whatever you want to say. So how do we address this? Let's talk about what is intimacy. You know, at a time where I was more of a sexually uh, loose person, I didn't really believe that sex was an intimate act. It was just something that two people did together for fun. But I've come to believe that if you're inside somebody's body, or if you're having someone inside your body, that's pretty intimate. It, it may not be emotionally intimate, but there is an intimacy about it. You can't get much closer. Uh, so what is intimacy really? Intimacy is a combination of things. Intimacy, emotional intimacy, and true physical intimacy is built on three legs. The first is caring communication. The second is empathy, walking in the other person's shoes. And the third is trust. And so I would argue that when infidelity is present, there's been a breakdown of at least one of those three things. I mean, certainly there's a breakdown in trust. There's also a breakdown in empathy. Um, pretty consistently when people commit an act of infidelity, they're not thinking at all how the other person will feel. If they want to continue to con commit the act of infidelity, they have a clue how the other person might feel because they're working really hard and creatively to avoid having this be found out and to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. But they don't really understand how they would feel. They think about how they might feel, but they don't really understand how they would feel. In fact, I find working with people who have infidelity in their marriage pretty consistently, uh, whether man or woman, they miss one another. They have different needs from one another and they have different perceptions of what those needs are. There is a breakdown in communication, a breakdown in trust and a breakdown in empathy. And if you're concerned <laughs> that your marriage is gonna become one of the eight out of 10 marriages that has infidelity present in it, take a look at those three qualities. How much caring communication is there? How much are you talking about your mental and emotional needs? How much are you saying, well, honey, the pandemic's over and I've noticed you're still a little blue. You wanna talk about it? Or maybe you should see a therapist if you can't talk to me about it. Or I've noticed we haven't been physically intimate with each other is everything okay? What's going on? And you can't really have empathy unless you learn to listen. So when they do start talking, make sure that you're listening. And I've done a lot of presentations on how to do committed listening. So I'm not going to go over that again. But basically, you want to make sure that you're listening and reflecting back what you're hearing so that they know that you're really listening to them. And if you're really listening to them, you'll start to understand where they're coming from, what's going on, and you will develop a deeper understanding of who they are and where they're coming from, and empathy will happen. When you start having these caring communications, when there's enough trust that these communications are honest, and trust means removing criticism and snarky remarks, and even sometimes joking, because joking can be a form of criticism, and when you're really listening and having caring communication, that's when you have the opportunity to start building a needs-based relationship. 
And so the first thing you need to realize is you can't fulfill all his or her needs. The end. You can't. No human being can possibly fill all the needs of another human being. Despite that experience of being in love where you were each other's be all and end all. The truth is that when you were in love, you set aside a lot of stuff in order to have that experience. You did not focus on work. You did not focus on friends. You did not focus on your own development. You were totally Google, uh, gaga eyed and focused on one another. That's part of why being in love can't go on forever and ever. In order to develop yourself and your marriage together, you need to get that you're not gonna fulfill all of their needs, but you can work at fulfilling them. So let's start with mental and emotional needs. There are some mental and emotional needs that can only be fulfilled through personal development. Actually, let's roll this conversation back, right? The truth is who really fulfills your needs, my needs? Who really fulfills my needs? Are my needs only to be fulfilled by outside sources? Or does it come from somewhere inside of me? And that's the question I wanna ask yourself. Are my needs being fulfilled from outside sources or are they being filled from somewhere inside of me? So another thing I can tell you about those clients who I worked with who had infidelity in their marriages, they were trying to fulfill their needs from an outside source, but in the end, they returned to their marriages because even though it was exciting and new and it jolted them out of their stupor to have that affair, it did not fulfill their needs. So the only place that needs can really be fulfilled is inside of ourselves. And if you have, a, from the spiritual point of view, that is that connection to everyone and everything. When we're connected to everyone and everything, they are inside of us and, and we have that sense of being a part of, but it's still within us. We can turn outside to God if we're believers of some kind, but in the end, that Godhead is residing within us. Uh, we can turn, if we're not believers, we can turn to that connection to the universe. But in the end, then the answer is even more inside of us. We're never going to get the answers we want from other people. We're never going to get the love we need from other people. But they can help us with that. And so the question is, how can we help our partner fulfill their needs? I heard this woman, I was on a, what is it called? Uh, Clubhouse. I was in the clubhouse call yesterday and this woman got out there and she said, I need a man to fulfill me four or five times a day. And I have not yet met the man who can do that. And I am not an nymphomaniac, she said. And I don't know if she is or she isn't. But what that told me was two things. First of all, it told me that when she says, I need she's looking for fulfillment outside of herself. And she's not, and she does not, she's not, does not feel she can manage her own needs, right? Um, if I'm hungry, I don't have to eat. In fact, I can not eat for many days at a time and be hungry. If I have a desire for physical sex, I don't have to act on it. And I won't die if I don't act on it. And I won't feel fulfilled and unhappy if I don't act on it. In fact, if I don't eat for 10 days, that's not going to make me miserable if I have the right mindset. So our body does not determine our happiness, nor does it, it may determine our needs. There are needs that we have to, to take care of this body, but our body does not determine our happiness. And the second thing it told me was that she very, very much believed that her man would have to perform four or five times a day instead of maybe being creative and finding other ways to fulfill her. And so there was a closeness to that statement on two levels. And one was she was close to where her happiness, her joy and her fulfillment comes from really. And she was close to what are the possibilities? Should she meet a man who can, who fills her emotional, her need for emotional and spiritual connection but maybe falls short on the physical side? Would there be a work through, right? And so that's what I want you to consider. There, probably we've all fallen in love with someone who's maybe not perfectly in alignment with us and where we set our values, physical, emotional, spiritual, 
what we value the most is going to impact a lot the lens through which we judge that relationship by. But there, keep in mind, there are always work throughs. I have a couple where uh, one person is a very intense believer and the other one is agnostic. And the one who's agnostic further uh, hates religions of all kinds and feels that religions are the destruction of the planet. And the believer is involved with the religious faith. And how do they work it out? Well, they work it out because the agnostic is very clear that the believer is not totally hooked by the religion. And the believer is very conscientious about acknowledging the agnostic's needs and feelings and doing their, be their best to communicate to the agnostic what that spirituality means for them in non-religious terms. And so they work through that. It's not a perfect fit. They have different, but they, and their overarching concept of spirituality is still in connection. So they focus on that. They focus on the commonalities and they de-emphasize the, what am I gonna call them? The disconnects, the places where they're missing one another. And there's an understanding between them that the believer is going to go to a spiritual community to do whatever that person needs to ha have that kind of connection. And there's an understanding that the agnostic is gonna do whatever they need to fulfill their sense of connection and they meet somewhere in the middle. And because there's an understanding, there's no infidelity in those acts. So I'm asking you to consider what are the needs of your partner mentally, emotionally, mentally slash emotionally, kind of the same thing. Like we tend to think of mentally as meaning intellectually, but I mean really emotionally, spiritually and physically. And where are you meeting each other on those three planes? And what are your agreements and understandings on how each of you individually are gonna seek fulfillment? And will you seek fulfillment within yourself, within the marriage? Or are there things that you're gonna to need to go outside the marriage to seek fulfillment on? Like I started to leap into uh, work you know, the personal development. A lot of times we develop ourselves personally in our work. How engaged are you going to be in your work? What sacrifices are you both willing to make for you, for, for you to be engaged and fulfilled in your work? And is there an implicit, ex, oh no, excuse me, an explicit understanding about that? So whatever, whatever, the, whatever you're going to give up in your relationship so that one individual can get it, whatever they can fulfill their need for self-development, through another vehicle, it needs to be an explicit understanding, not an assumption. Because when you walk into the world of assumptions, oh, it's just, that's part of being married. That's when you're opening the door for breakdowns in communication, breakdowns in intimacy, breakdowns in empathy, breakdowns in trust. And that's when people start to say, screw this, I'm gonna go get my needs filled somewhere else. And I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna think about it or talk about it. So if you want to avoid infidelity, this is the ground that you want to work on. And it isn't really about avoiding infidelity. If you want to embrace intimacy and the greater understanding, this is the ground, the fertile ground you need to walk on. And I'm going on a long time here. I'm going to just knock it off here. If you actually have infidelity in your marriage, this is the ground that you can heal on. You, you know, basically you acknowledge that that infidelity is based on a broken relationship and that you won't go back to the being in love, but you may be able to recreate or create a new marriage if you're willing to negotiate and talk and meet on this common ground. If you have any questions about this, reach out to me at rich at richinrelationship.com. My challenge to you is go home and look at what are your explicit and assumed uh, agreements about meeting your own needs through your marriage and outside of your marriage. And let me know, comment, email me, do the work and grow intimacy in your relationship.